Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, the gospel spreads to Judea, Samaria, and Africa. The Lord had said the gospel was to be preached in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. To show the fulfilment of this, Acts can be summarised as follows. This is in chapter 1, verses 1 to 26, preparation for preaching. Chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 7, verse 60, preaching in Jerusalem. Chapter 8, verse 1 to 25, preaching in Judea and Samaria. Chapter 8, verse 26 to 28, verse 31, preaching to the uttermost parts of the earth. Chapter 8, verse 26 to 40, towards Africa. Chapter 9, verse 1 to 16, verse 5, towards Asia. Chapter 16, verse 6 to 18, verse 17, towards Europe. Chapter 18, verse 18 to chapter 26, verse 32, in Asia. And chapter 27, verse 1 to 28, verse 31, in Europe. So, the Gospel was preached in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So we come to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 25, preaching in Judea and Samaria. Acts 8 begins with the words, And Saul was consenting unto his death. The young men laid their clothes at his feet. He himself did not throw stones at Stephen, because it did not befit one of the judges to do so, we find in chapter 26, verse 10. And yet, in a sense, Stephen was not dead. He lived again in Paul the Apostle, who was able to say at the end of his life, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown, a Stephen, or Stephen, of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing, when we shall see the heavens opened ourselves. The second of Timothy 4, verse 8, and the first of Timothy 1, verses 15 to 16. Stephen's final prayer, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge, was certainly answered in Saul's case. At that time, the great persecution that followed the death of Stephen scattered the flock to Judea and Samaria. They took the gospel with them and continued to preach as Christ had said they should. How different to the followers of Theudas, whose scattering brought them to naught, chapter 5, verse 36. This work was of God, and the disciples' commission to preach in Judea and Samaria began to be fulfilled. The apostles remained in Jerusalem to strengthen and encourage the remnant of the ecclesia. Strangely, the apostles were not arrested, and consequently the ecclesia soon reformed, we see in chapter 9, verse 26. One wonders if the priests and council were fearful to touch them because of the miracles they did, and their past embarrassing experience with them. We can understand the great lamentation devout men made over Stephen. He had been highly respected in the Jerusalem Ecclesia, being full of faith and wisdom. Meanwhile, Saul made havoc of the Ecclesia, committing men and women to prison without trial, entering without warning into the homes of the brethren that informers had reported to him. This, of course, happened similarly to the Jews across Europe last century when the Nazis under Hitler gave in to bloodlust and offended against all decency. The Diaglot says, violently seizing. The same word is used in the Septuagint of a wild boar coming out of the wood and wasting the vine out of Egypt, as we see in Psalm 80 verse 13. So severe was Saul that he even forced the execution of sisters in Christ, chapter 22, verse 4, and chapter 26, verse 9 to 11, Galatians 1, verse 13. 
What did he care for orphans left to fend for themselves, so long as righteousness, as he then saw it, was done? Be not righteous over much. If our righteousness hurts the brethren, there is something very wrong. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 16 says. Paul, though soon forgiven, lived with a terrible conscience hereafter, as we find in the first of Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 to 16. Philip preached Christ. Because of the persecution, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, where he preached Christ and caused great joy in that city by healing many with mental illness, palsies and lameness. No doubt the joy was as much in the forgiveness of their sins as in the healing that confirmed it. Soon Philip, who had been one of the seven, became known as Philip the Evangelist, a word meaning messenger of good, chapter 6 verse 5 and 21 verse 8. While continuing the work of his Lord to the Samaritans, John 4 verse 39 to 42 is a connection here, he met Simon the sorcerer who bewitched the people, giving out that he was some great man. The Samaritan said, This man is the great power of God. Evidently he was some sort of charismatic leader. But now their eyes were opened, and believing the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised. These two themes comprise the gospel. Philip taught them in the correct order, for Jesus had come preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God first, and saying, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God is the one hope of your calling, centred on one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which is as the truth is in Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 5 and verse 21. Peter and John in Samaria. The people responded because they saw that Philip's miracles were genuine. To his credit, even Simon humbled himself, confessing to his sorcery and submitting to baptism. Before long, the ecclesia in Jerusalem heard news of what was happening, so the apostles sent Peter and John to investigate. These two, on seeing the truth of the report and the sincerity of the Samaritan believers, prayed for them and gave to selected believers the gift of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of their hands. What a change of attitude this was for John, who had wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans, but was rebuked by the Lord, as we have it in Luke 9, verse 54. Had John called down fire at that time, there would have been no Samaritans now for him to give the Holy Spirit to. Soon he was praying for their guidance and blessing, especially in the face of inevitable Jewish opposition when they heard of the conversion of despised Samaritans, as we see in Acts 11 verse 17. We learn here that the Holy Spirit did not normally fall on believers, but could only be passed on by apostles. See chapter 19, verse 6. Not even Philip, who had the gift of miracles or powers and healing, was able to pass on the gift. We read that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Because of this, we find, later in this chapter, that the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing, but without a spirit gift. The way the Spirit was given in Acts 2 and Acts 10 is an exception to the rule. Simon offered money to buy the gift and the power to pass it on. But many cannot buy everything, as Solomon wrote. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Proverbs 13, verse 7. 
Simon's offer showed he lacked proper understanding, for the truth is free. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, come buy wine without money and without price, we read in Isaiah 55 verse 1. Therefore Peter said, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Matter is the word logos that is used here. The Greek word for gift here is doria, and therefore implies not just the spirit, but also the wider gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. You might like to see the comment on Acts chapter 2, verse 28. Peter called upon Simon to repent of his wickedness and pray for forgiveness for the thought of his heart, his own desire for prestige and power. His heart was not right with him, neither was he steadfast in his covenant, as we read in Psalm 78, verse 37. Simon's attitude almost constituted blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, as we have it in Matthew 12, verse 31. He was in the gall of bitterness, a profane person who tried to sell his birthright for present advantage. He was in the bond of iniquity, or bands of wickedness, as Isaiah has it in chapter 58, verse 6. But all was not lost. Simon pleaded, Pray ye to the Lord for me. His appeal for the elders' prayers on his behalf is recommended to all who commit grievous sin, as we have it explained in James 5, verses 14 to 16. Though there is sin unto death, I do not say he shall pray for it. 1 John 5, verse 16. Simon was totally humiliated that no flesh should glory in his presence. Never again would he be a leader. His sin is not forgotten to this day, for his name has passed into our language in the word simony, meaning buying or selling ecclesiastical preferment. Acts 28, verse 26 to 40, the truth spreads to Africa. Taking the gospel to Samaria began the long process of breaking down the Jewish prejudice against Gentiles in the faith. The gospel would go from the Jews, Shem, to Ethiopia, Ham, and then to Europe, Japheth. Philip was a Greek Jew, and therefore probably not as exclusive as other Jews. The work in Samaria, now being supervised by the apostles, Philip was directed by an angel to new fields. He arose and went at noon, the authorised version says south, compare chapter 22 verse 6, uh, at noon from Jerusalem to Gaza. This was a route that was deserted, the authorised version, desert. Philip was always ready to preach the word, being instant in season, out of season as Paul says in the second of Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. On his way, he met a man of Ethiopia returning from a visit to Jerusalem. This man was not a Jew, but a proselyte who was not allowed to enter the temple, especially as he was a eunuch too. You might like to see Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. He was of great authority under Candace, that name actually is a royal title, queen, probably of the kingdom of Meroe, which Pliny recorded was governed by queens. She may even have been in the line of the Queen of Sheba. The eunuch had a charge of her royal treasure, the Persian word for which is Gaza, and Gaza itself is on the highway to Egypt and Ethiopia. Philip preached unto him Jesus. This man was reading from a scroll of Isaiah, which he had probably bought in Jerusalem. He was obviously sincere, diligent, and educated. Why hadn't the eunuch learned the truth in Jerusalem? 
He almost certainly did hear about Jesus there, since Jerusalem was full of speculation, but had probably suffered a setback when he found himself barred from the temple because he was not a Jew. Christ will send someone a long way to teach one man the truth. So the Spirit told Philip to go near. He ran to the chariot and heard the man reading aloud from his scroll. Philip then created the opening. Understandest thou what thou readest? And was invited into the chariot to explain who it was that Isaiah had written about when he predicted the death and resurrection of Yahweh's suffering servant in chapter 53. So Philip taught him as the truth is in Jesus, Ephesians 4, verse 21. No doubt what Philip taught the eunuch from the prophets was similar to the teaching of the risen Lord from the prophets to the two on the road to Emmaus that we read of in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. Together they read, And who shall declare his generation? With what growing excitement this eunuch would listen as Philip explained that Yahweh's suffering servant, cut off and without children, shall yet see his seed. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Isaiah 56 verses 4 to 8. He went on his way rejoicing. Providentially it must have rained hard in the area shortly before, so that when water was seen, Upon his confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. In so doing, this great man humbled himself before his servants. Obviously, there would be drinking water carried by the eunuch and his retinue, but this was not enough for a baptism. In those days there was no substitute such as sprinkling an unbelieving babe with holy water, for the full immersion of a believer in the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. The eunuch had stated his belief that Jesus is the Christ, or Messiah and Son of God. This belief, though vigorously denied by Jews, is an essential confession before baptism, that you might have life through his name. John 20, verse 31. The name of Jesus, Yah shall save, is the key to eternal life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Christ prays in John 17, verse 3. After they came out of the water, the Spirit caught away Philip to Azotus, some twenty-five miles, forty kilometres from Gaza. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, where he settled. For he was still there twenty years later, we see in chapter 21, verse 8. When Elijah had been caught away by the Spirit, he was not found because his work was finished until the kingdom. Malachi 4 verse 5. Most of Philip's work still lay ahead of him, but we will have to wait for the kingdom before we find out what else Philip did in the spirit in those intervening years. The nameless eunuch went on his way rejoicing, determined to preach the word in Ethiopia, for is it not written, Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands to God. Written in Psalm 68, verse 31.